Actually, I was originally going to uh, play the music, the actual music, uh, theme music, which I was just ridiculously sort of singing along to. Uh, but uh, I was reading the fine print here on the on the C of D. What does it say? It says Big Screen Records. Well, that's not bad, except when you look further, it says. Uh, by, let's see, it's uh, manufactured exclusively by Warner Brothers Records. Uh-oh. See, uh, the parent company, you got to figure that out because Warner Music Group, they come down and put the hammer on you if you use their music inappropriately. Uh, they would be PO'd and they would jump in and they would ask YouTube to mute my video and the, since the video consists primarily of me talking uh, it would be pretty stupid for it to be muted <clears throat> and if you were hearing impaired you probably got a big laugh just then but uh, no a hearing person was able to hear what I just said and that's the problem that's what it would be like the whole the whole thing unless you can read lips well 1995 the fifth year of Halloween Horror Nights what a year that was first of all a gauntlet had been thrown down yes for the first time, at the same time Halloween Horror Nights was going on, well, just one night actually, Halloween night itself, but at the same time, down the street a ways, at a certain magical kingdom, an after hours Halloween event was being held for the first time. Yes, that was the year that those people over there decided to compete and try to, to, to wrestle over ownership of theme parkish Halloweeniness here in Central Florida by declaring that they would host the very first Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party. <laughs> oh boy. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, that's continued and it's expanded everything else. But, has it, has it, slowed Universal down. No, no, it hasn't. Universal Studios Halloween Horror Night still reigns supreme. <laughs> yes. No, the real competition, the real competition comes from another theme park way off in Tampa. But they're so far away that it really doesn't compete that much. But at least they have a decent event over there. Uh, <clears throat> But that happened uh, a bit later. <coughs> mm. At any rate, in 1995, Universal decided to do something even more radical after four exciting years and the event getting bigger every time. They decided, they decided that they would have a presenting character because the advertising had become so interesting, especially the tie-in with Fox and with Pepsi and other products. The advertising had become crucial. Let's have a character, a presenting character that will stand for, that would host and be <clears throat> the presiding spirit of the event, so to speak. You know, like Santa Claus would be for Christmas. And so they created. No, it's not yet. It would be about five years before someone would be created for this purpose. Now, they acquired a character from an outside source to use the, the, the in, industry lingo uh, outside IP. <clears throat> you, you pee outside? What, are you a dog? Don't you use the bathroom like everybody else? No, no, intellectual property. Mm, intellectual property. Yes, that's right. And, oh, there goes Bob. 
Anyway, intellectual property, which uh, in this case was the Crypt Keeper. Yes. <clears throat> now, a little bit about the Crypt Keeper. And if I do enough backstory on the Crypt Keeper, this is going to be two or three videos. But oh, what the hell. Anyway, backstory on the Crypt Keeper. We have to go way back through time again. We're just like if we were in the TARDIS or Bill and Ted's phone booth or Doc Brown's DeLorean, or all three at the same time. Because when you travel through time, you can put your TARDIS, uh, you, can, you can actually fit the DeLorean and, and the phone booth in the TARDIS, because it's bigger on the outside than it is on the inside. And so that way, you can travel through time while you're traveling through time, by putting a time machine inside a time machine. And you put the whole thing in the Pandora cut and it explodes. It looks a lot like the lantern, doesn't it? Anyway. Getting, I, I'm. I've had too much pop this morning, uh, so if I get, this is going to be an odd video. Anyway, uh, getting back to it, uh, let's go back to the 1950s, just like Marty McFly. Now, in the in the 1950s, the superhero comic was starting to get a little old. They'd been around since the 30s, and the kids were looking for something newer and more exciting, and they found it. Uh, a man named William Gaines, see? William Gaines had taken over his father's failing comic book company, which was called Educational Comics. Max Gaines, originally in the old country, it was spelled G A with umlauts N C, it's pronounced Gaines. And he was Jewish, and he came to the United States, met uh, uh, a nice girl who wasn't Jewish which made his parents go, oh, that chick sucked to put your father in an early grave. But nevertheless, he marries the girl, and so his son then isn't Jewish because, although his father is, but he's raised as whatever uh, religion his mother is. Actually, be probably because of the confusion, he decided just to be an atheist and give up the whole thing. But anyway, Max had the idea of putting out these educational comic books for the edification of American youth. <laughs> Yes, he'd put out these comic books that were mainly Bible stories. Uh, I guess they were mostly Old Testament Bible stories because Max was an Old Testament kind of guy. So, you'd, you know, you get your comic and read about how David c got, uh, came over adversity and all of the, <coughs> you know, the obstacles of being a little kid combating this big, huge, massive, terminated Goliath. And he managed to beat him with a rock and his faith in God. And how Daniel was in the lion's den, and Noah and the ark, and you know the patriarchs, and Moses, and Abraham, and all these great Old Testament stories. And every once in a while, he'd throw in Jesus, uh, so that the Goyim will read it too. And this was a great comic, and it was terrific, except nobody read it! <laughs> because why would you want to read these Bible comics when if you want to read the Bible, you just go to church or temple or whatever religion you like, and you go to your actual place of worship and you read your Bible or your, your Tanakh or whatever version of the holy book you like and read it and enjoy it and, and pray and find comic books you want to read about Superman. And if you want any kind of, you know, Old Testament stuff, you can take that allegorically. I mean, Kalel is Hebrew for mighty man of God anyway, right? So, you know, right. So you can get all that stuff out of those superhero comics and allegorical style. But it's more fun because they wear, wear long underwear and, and, and they have muscles. And Wonder Woman's looking kind of hot, too. So whatever your orientation, there's somebody in the comic books that'll be interesting. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's fun. So all of this stuff, and kids are doing that, but it, it was starting to get old, and now they were reading st uh, comic books about gangsters. That was, uh, that was getting popular. And weird science fiction mutants, uh, atomic bomb stuff, because it was the 50s. Well, William took over his dad's business. You know, he says, son, take over the business. I'm going to retire to Miami. And so he's going to do this, and he's thinking, this stuff ain't selling. I'm going to save my dad's company. He won't approve. But I am going to find something that sells. You know what? I'm going to tell stories that are just as, just as morally important and will teach the kids right from wrong, but in a totally different way. I'm going to fool them. See? Now, a lot of the artists working at the time had been soldiers in the Second World War, and some of them had seen atrocities in, in Germany. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of them were Jewish. And, you know, they were worried about what relatives they might have still had in the old country and found they had very few of them left. 
and they came back with horror stories about the, the, the atrocities in the camps when they had liberated them, and you know this really preyed on their minds. And there was one guy in particular, Kurtzman, I think, Katzman, I, I can't remember his name, uh, Kirshner. Um, I'll have to look it up later. Sorry, but he had a knack for drawing zombies, this d d d d decomposing living corpses, and part of that came from Holocaust you know, experiences in the war and nightmares that he had about that. And he would try to exercise that from his subconscious by drawing these pictures, which a lot of artists have done over the years anyway, of that kind of stuff. And these horrible, decaying corpses were just ghastly beyond belief. In fact, they started calling him Ghastly as a nickname. And so this stuff, uh, and William Gaines saw that and said, this is what we're going to put in the comic books. Scary ass shit. Yeah, but we'll do it in a really cool, we'll see, we'll have this evil fucking bastards, we'll do something really sick and wrong, and when they do this thing, like murder, you know, uh, cheating an old widow out of her life's fortune so she starves to death, that kind of horrible, bad, rotten sons of bitches, and then when they do this, there'll be supernatural retribution. You know, the zombies, the vampires, the werewolves, the ghouls will get those bastards, and they will deserve it. And the kids will read these wonderful horror stories and they'll love it, but at the same time they'll learn a valuable life lesson. You know, if you cheat, you know, your brother out of his life fortune, you know, zombies will come and eat your flesh. And this is this is important. <clears throat> so these are and if you go back and you check these comics, you'll find I'm right. You'll find in every case there's this profound sense of morality and the evil and the wicked are punished. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. Mm. 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 Now, now, Gaines had a, a, a way of explaining this. Um, he said, say for example, j just, you know, just a silly story, a silly thing. Say that there's this guy who has this obsession with sharpening pencils. And so he takes these sweet, innocent little pencil who never harmed anyone and torches it to death by sharpening it and sharpening it and sharpening it until there's nothing left but a tiny little nubby stump. And it's dead. Ha 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 ha. And he does this to the pencils out of his sick, perverted you know, deviancy of pencil cruelty. Then, all of a sudden, from the planet out there, Uranus or somewhere, come a swarm of, of alien pencils swarming out of Uranus and come down to the planet Earth and grab the guy and have this giant cosmic sharpener and put his head in there and crank it up and sharpen it down there's nothing left but a e yucky, sticky, gooey, bloody point. And that's the idea. You sharpen the pencils, the pencils sharpen your head! Yes. That was the basic eye for an eye morality of the comic books that William Gaines created. Tales from the Crypt, The Vault of Horror, and The Haunt of Fear. And to present the stories, they came up with these host characters. So that you'd have one level of detachment from the horror. So there'll be a person, when you open the comic, there's this, this character, and he'd used to be kind of silly and make really bad jokes and puns. You know, hello, boys and boils and ghouls. <laughs> exactly, like that. And you'd have <clears throat> the Crypt Keeper was in the uh, Tales from the Crypt, and the Vault of Horror was hosted by the Vault Keeper, and the Haunt of Fear was hosted by the Old Witch. <laughs> this hag with one gooey eye, and the other one was... Uh, and this dark trinity basically hosted these comics. Now, the Crypt Keeper back then was just this dude in a robe, you know, with a hood. Uh, actually, I think he didn't have the hood. He had, no, he, yeah, the Vault Keeper had the hood. Uh, the Crypt Keeper didn't have the hood. So you said a robe and kind of scraggly hair, but a regular guy. <coughs> the Vault Keeper had longer, wider hair, and a little bit longer, more like, Leno Chin, kind of kind of a hag looking guy, but he was a guy in a purple robe with a hood, and and the old witch was an old witch. Yeah. <clears throat> so these three, they had their stories and they were rather uh, fun, and it lasted for a while until a terrible thing happened. This uh, German scientist who had immigrated to the United States after the war, 
and uh, mm, let's just say uh, a physician uh, <clears throat> probably had. Oh, continued. 